you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Luke chapter 16. Um, we're going to just jump into the message today. Uh, I'm going to pick up, we kind of ran out of time last week. Uh, this, the theme last week was you cannot serve God and money. Um, you can't have two masters. Uh, Jesus tells a very strange story in Luke chapter 16 of a dishonest manager. And instead of reading the whole text again, i just tell the story real quickly. This rich man had a lot of money and property, and he had a manager that took care of it. And the manager was stealing from him. And the owner begins to realize that and tells the manager, uh, give an account for what you've done, and uh, you're going to lose your job. So the manager says, I don't have much time left. While I'm still manager, I've got to take care of my future. So he started calling in all of the debtors that owed his master money. And he said, well, if you owe 1,000 gallons of oil, let's rewrite the bill and let's say it's 500. And then another guy, you owe this much wheat, we'll cut that by 25% and we'll make a new bill that says you owe that much. And he was going on and on and he said, because I'm, I'm, I'm too weak to, sh to dig ditches, basically, and I'm too ashamed to beg, so I'm going to make some friends. So that when I lose my job, somebody will take me in. The owner finds out what he's done, and he actually, actually commends the man, at least for being shrewd and trying to take care of himself. And then Jesus says um, something uh, very strange in verse 8. First it says, And his master, Luke 16, verse 8, praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. And then Jesus says, For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. Jesus says he, he never commends the dishonest man. Nothing about what he did was right. It wasn't his money to cut in half or buy a quarter or whatever else. He was being totally uh, dishonest. But what Jesus says, and he's trying to get that rise out of the disciples on purpose, uh, well, how can that, anything in that be right? And he said, well, there isn't anything right except for the fact that he's more shrewd in dealing in a worldly system than the children of light are in dealing in a spiritual system. Now, he's not calling us, us, calling us to dishonesty. He's calling us to shrewdness. And so Jesus says, verse 9, make friends for yourselves by means of the money of unrighteousness so that when it fails, they will receive you into eternal dwellings. Also a very strange statement. Jesus is basically saying, use the resources you have to invest in what matters because when the end comes and Jesus returns and the kingdom is established, all that's going to matter to you are the people that you were involved with to help bring them to a relationship with God so that they can live forever. And he says they will receive you into eternal dwellings. Jesus actually was calling for his church to be shrewd about the future and to invest in, and to leverage the resources they had to make eternal differences. That's what Jesus is talking about. And so last week, just a real quick uh, recap, four things we learned that we are not supposed to do with money that God teaches in here. We don't waste it. We don't love it or live for it. We don't trust money for our security. And we, don't, we shouldn't expect money to satisfy. The Bible says very clearly, man's life, a woman's life is not made up in the abundance of things. And in Ecclesiastes, he says, he who loves money will never be satisfied with money. If that's what you're about, you'll never be satisfied with it. And then we begin to look at things that God does teach us about money. First thing is, it all belongs to God. We are just managers. We are the manager in the story. God is the owner. I made the statement, who owned the property you're living on before you owned it? They didn't get to keep it, did they? And neither do you. You won't own it either for very long. We're all just temporary managers of stuff. And so let's not spend our whole lives trying to gain that which we cannot keep anyway. That's why it says, Jesus says, that he who loses his life will actually find it. And he who finds his life will lose it. It's the only thing that you're going to keep forever is what you invest in eternal matters. And he says so, again, money will not satisfy what satisfies is is the things that God does and, and everything belongs to him. We're just managing it. 
And as I talked about, our worry will drop significantly when we realize that it's his stuff. I told the story last week of the car wreck of my son, and, and it happened during the time when I was putting this sermon together, and I was worried about, what am I going to do about another car? And, you know, kept the song kept running through my mind, another one bites the dust. <laughs> I have a tendency of that with vehicles and children. And uh, what am I going to do? And, and I told you last week, the Lord says, what are you talking about tomorrow? I went, oh, yeah, right. It's, the stuff isn't ours. None of it is. And so I said, okay, Lord, your car got wrecked. What are we going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? I have to help me out. Um, and God will if we trust him. And our worry drops when we realize that we're not the owners. That God is not. It doesn't mean that we don't have responsibilities. We'll talk about that in a minute. Another thing we looked at last week is God is using money to test us. We looked at that in Malachi chapter 3. The tithing was a test from the Lord. In fact, it's the only time in Scripture when he says, test me and see what I won't do. He said, bring the tithe in and test me. All other testing of God is a lack of faith. In this case, it's an act of faith. Test me. Bring the tithe in and see if I won't open the storehouses of heaven and bless you. My phrase that I use all the time, God promises in Malachi chapter 3 that the 90% that you have left over when you obey with the tithe will go, he promises it will go farther than the 100% will in disobedience. Now that makes no sense mathematically, but it does in the eternal realm. He says, test me. See. And so I say, take God at his word. If you don't tithe, you think, well, that can't work. Well, test him. Give him three months, six months. See if you're doing better or worse. If he doesn't do better for you, then do what you want. He's, he's the one asking you to test him. Now, I did talk last week. Tithing will not fix foolish spending. You can't be foolish with the 90% and expect it to be all right. God does still talk about responsibility and all that. But if we're doing the best we can in pursuing him, he promises that the 90% will go farther in obedience than the 100% will disobedience because he puts a curse on the 100 and blesses the 90. And when God blesses something, it goes way beyond. Remember the loaves and fish fed 5,000 people? It's impossible unless God's involved. And so he says, test. And we talked about the testing of the money because money is least important to him and most important to us. And we looked at that in Luke 16, 10 and 11. God says, if I can't trust you with money, I won't trust you with real riches. In other words, God doesn't consider money real riches. Real riches is what we do for spiritual work in the kingdom of God. And he says, if I can trust you with the money, I'll trust you with some bigger things. And so it's a place of testing for us. And money is... A tool to be used for God's purposes was the third thing we looked at. Use the tool of money to save time because you can't get time back, but you can get more money. So if you're going to use money for something, use it to save some time so that you can use that time for things that really matter, spiritual things. And that's kind of where we're going to focus today is this about time and, and how that affects our spiritual life and... and uh, also, our busyness, how that affects. As I was looking over this sermon again for this week, this, this idea of simplicity kept coming to mind, that we are to simplify our lives. And, and I saw a, a posting for pastors that talked about, uh, about seven ways that, that our spiritual life suffers when we're too busy. And I didn't use all those, but I pulled some of them out. We're gonna, that's kind of going to be where we end up today. But quickly, one thing we didn't talk about last week is that five things that Jesus liked about this dishonest manager. Not the dishonesty, but here, there are five things that he liked. Number one, he looked ahead. He looked ahead. I'm going to lose my job. I can't dig ditches anymore, and I'm too proud to beg. What can I do with what I have to fix my future? Now, Americans are, are not necessarily as good about figuring out their future as, as maybe we should be. So we need to look ahead, both not just financially, but spiritually mostly, what Jesus is talking about. But it's interesting, I found these statistics, you know, planning for your future. The average savings of the Europeans are, is 12%. The average European saves 12% back for their future. 
uh, the J Japanese people save on an average 25% of what they bring home is set aside for the future. Anybody want to guess what the U.S. savings rate is? What did you someone say? Probably what? Yes, negative 1%. We spend 1% more than we make on average, which means somebody is spending a whole lot more than they make, right? So, you know, our nature is not to, to really plan too much for the future, right? God wants us to look ahead, not just financially, that's one thing, and it's temporary, but most importantly, spiritually. And that's what Jesus is driving the point home here. This man knew his time was short to get things right so that his future would be as good as possible. Jesus is saying, your future also has to be set in the spiritual realm. And you've got a very short time to make that decision. I know 70 years, the Bible promises 70 years, maybe by strength a little longer. That, that for some of you, especially some of these over here on this side who are younger, 70 seems ancient, doesn't it? That's like... Robert's age or something, right? He is old. He is old. He, 70 seems old. It's not near as old as it used to be to me. It's amazing how fast it all flies. I remember my dad telling me, older you get, the faster time goes. I said, Dad, a second's a second. A minute's a minute. And I was wrong. <laughs> time flies when you get older. Like, when did all this happen? You know, my baby's having babies and, you know, and my youngest one has graduated and when did all this happen? And, and I'm, you know, 30 years old. And it's just, it's just amazing how fa fast things happen. Plus 22. But anyway, we won't get into that. What are we going to do with the time that we have? What he loved about this guy is that he looked ahead. Secondly, he made a plan. And Proverbs 69 says we should make plans, but count on God to direct our plans. All right? Um, third, he acted quickly. He did something about it. Scripture says today is a day of salvation. Act on what you know you need to do today. And the best use of money is to get people saved. When Jesus says they will welcome you into eternal dwellings, the people that you touched with your giving, the Louisiana folks, you know, that kind of investment and in loving on people, you'll see those people in eternity. Number five, and one thing he liked about this guy, he realized that we had to give an account. Romans 14, 12 says, yes, each of us will give an account of himself to God. So what are you doing with your time and your resources? Now I want to I talk for just a minute. We, we talked about we need to look ahead and plan. And, and sometimes I think that means to simplify there's a great book by Richard Foster called The Celebration of Discipline. And one of the disciplines that he talks about is the discipline of simplicity. Learning to simplify our lives. And that's kind of the focus I want to have this morning as we, as we kind of pull all this together. Jesus ends his discussion here about this whole idea of money. He says, you cannot serve two masters. For you'll hate the one and love the other, or you'll love the one and hate the other. You cannot serve God and money. And so he says, you just can't do it. It's, it's not that it's hard to do. He says, you cannot do it. If you're living for money, you can't be living for God. And if you're living for God, you, you won't be living for the money. Now, God may bless you with that. God did bless some of the richest people who ever lived with the money. Solomon was one of them. And God may give you that. His own son had no place to lay his head, right? Not everyone will be financially blessed. And, and I don't subscribe to that. If you just got enough faith that you're going to make money and be, you know, rolling in it. I, no, it's not the case. Jesus was righteous, righteous, and he had nowhere to lay his head. It doesn't always work that way. So if we can't serve two masters, if it's impossible, then, and we can't be about making money and serving God, the question is why. What is it about pursuing the things of the world that makes it hard? Making money sets you on the world's speed and not God's speed. It keeps you from simplifying your life, which I think has serious, serious consequences. I want to read for you a sort of sec short section from a guy that, uh, from that article I saw. I love this. It says, in 1967, how many of you are alive in 67? I was only three. All right. The experts at that time 
on time management delivered a report to the Senate. These experts believe that the speed of technology, satellites, and robotics will present a big problem for America and the workplace in the years to come. The problem? People would have too much free time. And here's what they concluded, and this is a quote from the report, 1967, to the Senate. Quote, by 1985, people might have to choose between working 22 hours a week or 27 weeks a year or retiring at 38. That, that was the actual quote from the report. Good call, experts, right? They need to all be fired. Almost 50 years later, we're moving faster than ever. We're addicted to speed, obsessed with hurry. This addiction now has a name called hurry sickness. Hurry sickness is defined as this, quote, a continuous struggle to accomplish more things and participate in more events in less time, frequently in the face of opposition, whether it's real or imagined, from other people. Actually got a name for it now, hurry sickness. And so we have all this technology that saves us time. You remember when you had to actually talk to your family in the morning before you all left so that everybody would know what they're doing during the day because you couldn't call them, right? Or you had to go back home to call them. Or you had to go to this little thing on the side of the road and drop coins in it and, and do this, right, and call somebody. I can drive down the interstate now and have my wife uh, <clears throat> FaceTime with my granddaughter in Minnesota, right? It's just amazing. We talked to our son in Africa, you know, and we could see him. Things have changed, technology changed, and it does. It saves us all kinds of time, but we seem to be busier than we've ever been before. Our pace, I think, is out of control. And if we compare our pace to the pace of Jesus' life, there aren't many similarities. Jesus was never rushed. He didn't cater to the demands of the world. He wasn't overwhelmed by life, even though he had an enormous mission to complete in a very short period of time. Three years to save the world. Jesus never rushed because he moved at God's pace. You see, hurry isn't from God. It's the world's pace. It's Satan's play, spa, pace. The psychiatrist Carl Jung said, Hurry is not of the devil. Hurry is the devil. I think he was right. I think there, we're, going to look at, we're going to look at five things today that I think that a rushed life, a life that is pursuing the things of this world that sets us at this rushed pace, five things, consequences of living a busy life, uh, spiritual consequences. Number one, a hurried life destroys your relationship with God. We have so much to do, we can't talk with God in the garden daily as we were created to do. Adam and Eve used to walk with God in the garden in the cool of the day. When's the last time you just took a stroll with God? We don't have time, do we? It's unfortunate. We weren't created for that. Intimacy with God requires stillness, attentiveness, silence. Now, Pastor, what makes you say that? Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. It's in the stillness and the quietness. When's the last time we had that? Right? I know what some of you are thinking. So what you're asking me to do is to spend some quiet time with the Lord. That's one more thing to do, Pastor. You're telling me to simplify, now you're saying you're adding one more thing for me to do. No, I'm telling you to simplify your life so that you're free already to do that. Why do you work and worry as much as you do? Have you ever really asked yourself that question? What are you working for? What is the purpose of your work? Now, work is encouraged by God, but not the pursuit of money. I'm not talking about being lazy. God's not calling us to be lazy. I think he's calling us to be productive, but just productive in things that matter. Now, you have to work. So you can pay the bills and do all that, but if you simplify your life, you don't have to work as much. Here's one of my absolute favorite stories, and you've probably heard it before, but I'm going to read it one more time. It's about a Mexican fisherman. Have you heard that? Great story. An American investment banker was at a pier of a small coastal Mexican village 
when a small boat with just one fisherman docked. Inside the small boat were several large yellowfin tuna. I don't think we're going to catch any of those tonight, are we? Yellowfin tuna at your pond? Okay. Um, the American complimented the Mexican on the quality of his fish and asked how long it took him to catch them. The Mexican replied, only a little while. The American then asked, why, don't, why didn't you stay out in it longer and catch more fish? The Mexican fisherman said he had enough to support his family, his immediate needs, with what he had. The American then asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? The Mexican fisherman said, I sleep late, fish a little for pleasure, play with my children, take siestas with my wife, Maria. I stroll into the village in the evening and I play guitar with my friends. I have a full and busy life. The American scoffed. I am a Harvard MBA and I can help you. You should spend more time fishing and with the proceeds, proceeds buy a bigger boat and with the proceeds from the bigger boat, you could buy several boats. Eventually, you'd have a fleet of fishing boats. Instead of selling your catch to a middleman, you would sell directly to the processor, eventually opening your own cannery. You would control the product, processing, and distribution. You would, even, you would need to leave the small coastal fishing village and move to Mexico City, then L.A., and eventually New York City, where you would run and expand your enterprise. The Mexican fisherman asked, but how long will all that take? To which the American replied, 15 to 20 years. But what then? Asked the Mexican. The American laughed and said, that's just the best part. When the time is right, you would announce an IPO and sell your company's stock to the public and become a very rich, uh, you would make millions. Millions, he says. Then what? The American said, then you would retire, move to a small coastal fishing village where you would sleep late, fish a little, play with your kids, take siestas with your wife and stroll in the village in the evenings where you could play guitar with your friends. <clears throat> Love that story. Why not enjoy the things in life that really matter when you're able to enjoy it? Do you know how many people I know who have retired and didn't live very long after that because their health was so destroyed from the stress of making it? This guy was making it. He, was, he had enough time to do and supply and take care of his family and to invest in things that he thought that mattered. I think it's a little more than just those things. It's spiritual things, kingdom work. What if you simplified your life in such a way that you wouldn't have to work the extra hours or the second job? I know it's crazy un-American to think to sell the big house and, and buy something smaller if you have to. My wife and I, and not boasting or anything, we just made a decision when, when our kids were young that we'd do what it had to do to, that she could stay home. Now, that's not for everybody. It was, it was what was for us. And to this point, you know, I've never paid more than $5,500 for a car in my life. Now, to some of you, that's a lot of money to spend on a car. To others, you think, you drive junk. Well, welcome to my world. First house we bought we spent $21,000 on it. We were living large. $21,000. But it's what we could afford where she didn't have to work. Now, again, that's a decision we made. I'm not casting guilt anywhere else. I'm just, it's what was important to us at the time. What if we simplified? <clears throat> what if we downsized intentionally and freed up money and time for kingdom work? What would happen in this world? I think a hurried life affects negatively our relationship with the Lord, as we shared here earlier. Second thing, and remember, Jesus often got away in solitude, didn't he? To focus on his God, so he could have a relationship with God that was necessary to see the world the way his dad saw it. He'd get up early and just go away in solitude. There are times when he could have been healing when he was off praying. As we're going to look at him, why didn't he start early? He was 30 years old when he started. He wasted 30 years, or did he? Or was he learning patience and God's pace and God's timing? The second thing, spiritual consequence of a too busy of a life, which is a life that pursues the world and its money, which you cannot do and serve God, a hurried life decreases your capacity to love others. 
Isn't it interesting that the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, starts with this, love is patient. It can wait. Love is not easily angered. Love does not leave at the first sign of trouble. Love doesn't rush to judgment. I think love and hurry can't coexist. One writer, Matthew Kelly, said in one of his books, relationships can only thrive under carefree timelessness. And this is something hurried people don't have. The more you increase your speed of your life, the less capacity you have to love others. Considering the two greatest commandments are to love God and love others, you need to consider whether your hurried life is costing you more than you realize. It saddens me to think about failed marriages and other issues that are a product of an impatient culture. I think of all the prodigal Christians who are struggling and they have been abandoned because we have no capacity to wait on them and to encourage them. Love is patient. A third thing, as a hurried life increases our power of temptation. This one I found intriguing. Why did Jesus wait until he's 30 to begin his ministry? Why did he immediately go into the wilderness? Why did he go immediately in the wilderness to be tested for 40 days in the wilderness? Why not just start his ministry before he did baptism? Through my American lens, it, it seems like Jesus wasted most of his life doing nothing. He could have performed miracles long before he was 30, and his following might have actually been bigger. Who knows? More people may know Jesus today if he had started his ministry earlier. As an American, this seems like a no-brainer, right, God? You tell God, why can't you see this? Why'd you have him start so late? Because we're moving at the world speed. The 30 years that Jesus spent in relative obscurity weren't wasted years. God was developing an important virtue in Jesus. Patience. At the right time, God sent his son into the world. At the right time, Jesus started his ministry. There's, you see this all throughout scripture. Moses was 80 years old before he led the people out of Egypt. Abraham was 75 when God told him he'd have a kid, and then he had to wait 25 more years before God would give him that kid. He didn't have to, but why did he? He needed Moses to learn patience, and that patience produces trust in God. Jesus didn't waste his 30 years. Now, that's what I found interesting. Through temptation, Satan tries to decrease the time between our impulse and our action. And in our instant gratification culture, Satan has masterfully deceived people. I thought that's intriguing to think about. One of Satan's goals is to get us to reduce the time between an impulse we have and an action. And when you're in a hurried pace and an instant gratification culture, which we are, one that pursues the things of this world, we have a hard time dealing with temptation. So many mistakes. Sex before marriage. Stealing, drunkenness, porn addiction are all a result of looking for instant gratification instead of waiting on what God says is best. Could it be that Jesus lived a perfect life largely because he started his ministry with a strong understanding of patience and waiting? He had learned to wait on God's best and God's timing, his pace. These virtues take time to build. And when, you're, when you nurture patience, you trust God to give you the things in his time. Satan says you need them now. God says there are times for everything under heaven. A fourth spiritual consequence of a fast life is that a hurried life numbs you to the injustices that breaks God's heart. Hurry is a desensitizer. Have you ever... Have you ever have that heartbreak moment with your kids when they come and they want to talk to you about something that you know in the scope of life is really really unimportant and they come to talk to you and you brush them off because you're doing your thing and you're in a hurry and you can see the absolute brokenness in their eyes I've done it I've experienced it still struggle with it 
Hurry is a desensitizer. As I said, it snuffs out moments of intimacy. With life to the point that we get used to living day after day with little deep feeling. We, we focus on what we've got to get done, and everything else out there becomes a blur. We, we live life at freeway speed. And when you live life at freeway speed, it's very hard to take, care, take in the details of the stuff going on around you. We don't have the time or the energy to consider the world outside of our lane. We become desensitized or unaware of the brokenness in the world. Our heart can become callous to the things that rarely break God's heart. When's the last time you thought about human trafficking or the abortion of millions around the world or the heinous treatment of God's people by ISIS? What about something a little closer to home? What about the broken heart next door? The depression and suicidal thoughts of the person around the corner from your house and all the other results of a cursed world. We sometimes are so hurried because we're keeping up with our things that we may not need that we miss the brokenness of the people around us, the things that are breaking God's heart are not breaking ours because we're too numb to them, because we're too fast. Final thing, a hurried life clouds your purpose and diminishes your passion. Purpose is a trendy word today, isn't it? It's also more elusive than the Loch Ness Monster. But God's idea of purpose isn't about doing something. It's about becoming. Often people think, well, what's my purpose? Well, what am I going to do? God is not so concerned with what you do as what you're becoming. So think about these questions. What, is, what does the Bible say the fruit of the Spirit is in our, love, in our life? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Is that describe your life? Maybe it, our hurried pace diminishes or clouds what our real purpose is. We talked about a couple weeks ago, we have one job, to bring as many people to the kingdom as possible, including ourselves. And so little that gets done because we're running full bore to keep up all the stuff around us. There's nothing wrong with stuff. The Bible actually says, enjoy the fruit of your hand, the fruit of your labor. Enjoy the wife and husband of your youth. Nothing wrong with enjoying those things. Nothing wrong with work. In fact, we're supposed to work. We're not supposed to be lazy. Work and, and do what you need to do to get the bills paid, but maybe God's talking to somebody today. I think he is because I just couldn't get away from the subject this week. Is asking you, you know, maybe it's time to simplify a little bit. Get rid of stuff instead of bringing it in. And begin to downsize your life so that you're free to do the things that are going to matter in your life. Are you a man or woman of integrity? Are you trustworthy? Do people know you most, respect you the most because you invest in them? A hurried life looks externally for answers to life's big questions, but a life at God's pace looks internally for those same answers. We, we fight the rat race. If I, just, if I just had that, then I'd be happy. Internally is where we find it. Jesus loved the dishonest manager because he prepared for his future with intensity. Not because he was dishonest, just that he realized his time was short and he had to make a decision to, to take care of his future. My question to you is, will you do that today? If our piano player would come up, we're getting ready for our closing song. Is Jesus yours, is my question today. You can have that blessed assurance. That's the song we're going to sing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. If you don't know Christ, the, the, the message for you today is that. I need to get on, on the board with that first. And, and begin to do the things. Get myself found and then help find others. And Lord, if that means simplifying to me, then let me know that. For some of you today who already know the Lord, the Lord's talking to you. Maybe... Maybe on both ends of the extreme, one is you're not doing enough. Maybe you are lazy. Maybe you're not working hard enough. And drawing on others to support you. Maybe you're on the other side. You, you work too much and don't have time for anything God wants. Maybe 
whatever it is, I just ask you to be honest with God. Lord, tell me what it is in my life. Maybe there's things in your life that are dead weight, that are they're dragging you down and holding you back. You know, often we, we think we own stuff, but stuff starts owning us, doesn't it? I spend my time fixing cars. <laughs> I just want them to drive and move, and move me around and serve the ministry I want to do. What is in your life that maybe it's time to let go of and move on to more healthy things and beneficial things for yourself, which means for the kingdom of God too? We're going to offer an invitation and we're going to sing two verses of blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. If you don't know him, be like this, this manager who said, you know, my time's short. I've got to make a decision now. He made a plan and he acted on it. You know what the plan is. You need to come to the Lord. We're going to offer that invitation as we close in song. Let's stand and sing together. Blessed assurance. Lord, it's just my prayer that we move at your speed. Whatever that is for us, Lord. And some people are called to, to succeed in business so they can fund ministries. Lord, some of us might be called to do the ministry. Lord, whatever it is, help us to know your pace and to live at it. Lord, if there's some here today who need to simplify, help them to have the courage to make that decision. For some who need to step it up, Lord, give them the courage to do that. Father, we just want to do, use, use and leverage all the resources we have for the things that are most important, to love you and to love people and to grow the kingdom of God. Help that to happen through us today and tomorrow and from then on until the day when we see Jesus come through the clouds. Lord, that's our prayer in his name. Amen. Amen.